All right. First rule of this channel, we do not talk about this channel. Second rule of this channel, this is not legal advice. So uh, what I want to talk about, and this ends up being a little bit more of a theory video than maybe like I was originally thinking about, uh, thinking about it being. What I was originally thinking about doing is kind of breaking down the tiers like running backs because the guys that we, we think are going to be bell cows, maybe could be bell cows and the ones that are going to be indefinitely split backfields. And it's kind of similar from a wide receiver standpoint, but it, it's not because what we're looking for is the guy who's going to be like the number one in, in an offense. And then how many, uh, how many, how much competition for those targets there's going to be with other guys. Um, that's going to hurt a guy, even if he's the number one in an offense, it doesn't mean that it's going to necessarily push him up into the category that we're, we're, we're looking for. So uh, when we, when we go looking for this year's Puka and, and last year's Puka or, you know, Puka last year was really easy to pull out because in most leagues he was going undrafted. And then with the injury surrounding Cooper cup, he goes from being a guy that like I saw as being a wide receiver two to, Hey, I got a shake and bake wide receiver one to start the year. And that process behind that basically is just like, Hey, there's a, there's a gap in the Rams offense that needs to be filled by a guy. And then they brought in a guy that, I liked as a prospect and then you know Bob's your uncle that's that's basically how simple that was so so other guys that I was right on last year when it comes to uh the wide receivers were let's see I gotta pull them up here I have like Nico Collins was a guy that I, I was just like hey um we've been talking about him for a long time he he has a brand new quarterback and they, there's a uh uh you know a void for a wide receiver one in that offense like Keenan Allen was a guy he's over that he was over the age apex last year but he's attached to a good quarterback he was going in the fourth round of most leagues. He's been a top 10 wide receiver. And it's like, well, all he has to do is do a little bit to be a top end two from his position where he's basically going as a mid-level wide receiver two. And same thing with Michael Pittman. He's just a guy that's like in an offense that there's a there, he's the number one in the offense. Like he was going, I think, the last year in like sixth or seventh round of certain drafts. Like it, it's just it's just easy to go, well, what's the worst he's gonna give me is a wide receiver three, and I'm paying a wide receiver three price for a guy that has wide receiver one upside built into that. So that's all we're kind of looking at when we look at our, our potential uh, wide receiver ones. And then as I break this down, as I'm getting ready for my rankings, my the wide receiver ones, it, it, I'm not looking for wide receiver ones. I'm looking for guys that um, push up in the draft that have, you know, safer ranges of outcomes. And then the same thing with like my, my wide receiver twos and my wide receiver threes, like wide receiver threes are all dart throws. There are guys that like could lose me or they're not going to lose me a league, but they all have like huge upside. That's how I see them. So there's guys in my, that wide receiver three range that I'm just not going to be interested because they don't have enough upside for me. And, and wide receiver twos, they they have to be able to win me a league. But I also realize that there's a there's a, a lot of risk involved with them just being those guys that I can pick up off the waiver wire most weeks. So anyway, when we start breaking these guys down, um, and I talked about this last year, like what we're what the biggest indicator that we're looking for is these targets. We kind of want, I shouldn't say we, I'm looking for a guy that's going to have like 200 targets. Like Cooper Cup two years ago, before he got injured, when he was on pace for like 12 targets a game, like that's the elite level you're looking for. So last year you had CD Lamb, uh, 181. I think uh, two years ago, uh, Justin Jefferson was up there at about 200 targets. You're looking for that like uh, 11 or 12 targets a game to be in that like legendary elite type range. Um, you know, like Michael Thomas a few years ago, where he had like 144 receptions. Like, those are the things that we're looking for to be the number one in an offense. And then, guys, even if they're like Amon Ross St. Brown or Keenan Allen, they can be very flawed and perfect from what we're looking for from a, a fantasy perspective. They're, they're not going to go get that 60 yard, like, you know, a bomb. Uh, contested catch type of guy they can be those technicians just based off the opportunity alone even though they may not be have the opportunity to have that uh, legendary elite type season they're still going to be you know relatively safe as a top tier guy so these are things we start breaking down and then the age apex and you know what are the competition you know are we going to see uh, the, the guys flop because going back to justin jefferson's rookie year that was one of the things that that was thought about um and rightfully so is Adam Thielen's already in Minnesota. Justin Jefferson is going to be capped as a wide receiver too. And then he finishes the season, I think, as wide receiver seven that year. So, like, these are all the stuff that we that I look at when I start ranking my wide receivers and then looking at the uh, complementary rankings for everybody else where, you know, just see if they're overvalued or undervalued because that's the name of the game. Like, um, I have it written down in my notes if you're, if you're wondering how to scroll back up. Like, 
my co-managers have to keep me honest because they know I get cute. I, I can be very bad and wrong on the top end guys because all the analytics say, hey, draft this guy, don't ask, uh, draft this guy. The variables tell me to do those things. Um, who Who's more riskier than not? But the back end guys, all I got to do to be right and win a league is be right on like one of my last six picks, one of my last seven picks, something like that. And I can win a league. And, you know, those up, upside guys are really easy based off the fact that all I got to do is be right on one of six. Like last year, I think I was right on like three or four of them in that range, you know, and, and it gets me, you know, the really good opportunity to win a league. I'm going to make playoffs. I know I'm going to have that lineup. It's going to scare everybody. And then it's just the, the luck that I can't control. So anyway, when we start breaking down these guys, we start looking at, and I, and I have Stefan Diggs right here to start off with, like, he's going to be 31 in November. I looked it up right before I went live. He finished wide receiver 10 last year. He's over the AJ Peck. So eight, the top of the AJ Peck is 29, usually 30, 31. They can have like high end productive seasons still, um, even though there, there tends to be this massive drop off for most of those guys when they hit to that age. But um, they're, they're never going to be that elite guy after the age of 29. And, you know, we there, there can be outliers. Maybe we'll get a guy who goes to 32. Maybe a guy at 30 can have like a top end season like a Mike Evans did last year. They just become really rare. And knowing that you're going to draft a guy as Stefan Diggs that come November, he's going to be 31. And we already know that downside's there. He already kind of, you know, fizzled out at the end of last year going into the draft. So, these are the things we start. Oh, I start looking at when I start building my rankings. So I do have 10 guys that I think are going to be wide receiver ones. I only think I have three guys that I would be comfortable taking in the first round of the draft. So breaking down from a, from a, 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 a team by team perspective, this is what we're looking for. Like San Francisco, there's four mouths to see, really defeat in that offense. And so Devo and, and, and Ayuk aren't going to be anywhere near, you know, uh, premium picks like that first or second round, they're, they're not going to be there. They're going to eat into each other. They're, they're going to be really simple to break down based off of like how over or undervalued they are. Cause their, their ranges of outcomes are going to be like very difficult to uh, predict ahead of time. Um, and then moving on to the bears, like the bears are going to project to be a high volume, a uh, high volume po passing offense. I did just move uh, DJ Moore into wide receiver two range off of this. Um, even though I think he, he should potentially be a wide receiver one. He's a guy that I think should be a, a fringe first rounder uh, based overall off of uh, the situation. Again, they're going to probably bring in Caleb Williams. Uh, Keenan Allen doesn't really bother me. Neither does Cole Komet. Uh, he was 136 targets last year, wide receiver six. Like there's a lot of stuff to like. The problem is those two variables, Caleb Williams and Keenan Allen, and you're playing with a little bit of fire if uh, you're overvaluing him a little bit in this one. I don't think that uh, the difference between him and Keenan Allen, Keenan Allen's probably not going to eat into him. They kind of have different skill sets at this point in their careers. But he would be a guy that I would probably rank outside the top 10. Um, I could even see him going in the second, but like you know, he's going to be down there a little bit. Uh, I, a lot of you guys that follow the channel will probably already know that like guys like Jamar Chase, like I'll just take off my board in general. Um, and it's not a knock on the player. It's the fact that he's going to be competing with opportunities with uh, T Higgins. So even if the offense is that higher vol volume passing offense, there's going to be weeks that I can bank on that. He's going to, you know, I shouldn't say bank on. There's going to be weeks that I know distributed over the course of the season that he's going to give me those less than 40 degree days just because they can go win a game with T Higgins. And that's the way it looks like it's going to be this year. And, and if he does it in the finals or the, the semis, I lose my league as opposed to some of the other guys, the guys that are going to have like the 180, 200 targets, the chances of them doing it in those weeks, the money weeks, I, you know, are, are much lower overall. So like, a Jamar Chase, like I don't think he's a first rounder this year. I would probably have him valued as a, a, a second round pick. And again, like you may disagree with me, your league mates may disagree with me or with you, but I would just go, hey, the, someone else's problem because I know that those void those void weeks are going to be there. Uh, with the with the the Bills, I already talked about Stefan Diggs a little bit. Um, that's why I would be moving Stefan Diggs down the board if you weren't already, already doing that. So uh, another team to talk about with the, the Broncos. So the only real guy that they have on the roster right now is Corlin Sutton. Um, with injuries and everything, he was at 90 targets last year. Um, and I don't see that changing. So the variable of the quarterback situation is going to move him down my board. I don't know what the quarterback situation is going to be like. 
right now. Um, and he's probably not going to ever hit the high enough passing volume or targets to get there. I mean, you, you would have to double what he did last year to, to have that like chance at a high end wide receiver one legendary type season. So again, uh, but the thing that I would be looking at in this offense is the guy that has the best road at the best value to be the one, number one is still going to have a lot of value to- towards me, even though uh, Keen or Cortland Sutton may not be quote unquote a wide receiver one. He still, depending on what the quarterback situation ends up being, has the best chance to be the number one in that offense. And therefore he has the road to be this year's Nico Collins. Um, based off of what we see right now. Now it could change a little bit, but that would be my my thought process on that. Like Cleveland's another really interesting one because Amari Cooper did finish so well, uh, or you know the the semifinals game where he did uh, the forty six points, like eleven for or fifteen for eleven, two sixty five, two touchdowns. Um, he is going to be over the age apex, so that would mean that like I would be leaning towards moving him down and moving Jerry Judy up. Um, even though overall, I think they're probably best range of the outcomes are going to be in that like two, three type range, but that's how I would view them overall. And then moving on to the Buccaneers, like uh, Mike Evans is already over the AJ Pex. I, I can kind of definitely see that he's going to regress um, listed as wide receiver five from last year um, based off everything. Like, yeah, I, I, do, I just don't think he's going to be able to maintain that at his age. And that's heavily based off of those touchdowns. Um, at the end of the season, probably Chris Godwin, um, based off of how he finished the season, is going to give me a little bit better upside versus value. Um, other, but I, I still don't think that he's going to necessarily hit that 200, 180, 170, 200, you know, target range to to get me there. And he's probably also never going to be that that touchdown machine that I need him to be. So I would probably downplay him versus that. So the Cardinals, um, not a lot to talk about. Like right now, the number one is probably going to be Michael Wilson coming off that rookie year. Um, it, maybe Kyler Murray's not a good quarterback. He's a good football player, just not a good quarterback. Uh, the other thing to remember is they're probably going to bring in my, Marvin Harrison Jr. He would be moving up my board a lot just based off of opportunity. Um, wouldn't necessarily look at putting him in uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. if he goes to the Cardinals as probably anything outside maybe like a third or fourth round draft pick at that po- at that point. Uh the Chargers this is going to be really interesting when I when I break this down between um Quentin Johnson and Josh Palmer right now those are the two guys that like are going to have the best opportunity to finish as the wide receiver one in offense attached to uh Justin Herbert. I'm not going to talk about Hayden Hurst at all, but anyway like these two guys where they're going to be relative to their value is is you know, relative to their ADP is going to tell me like how, how much they're worth throwing a dart at. Um, I would imagine the chargers are going to go out and they're going to, you know, draft somebody in, you know, to, to be the actual number one. I don't know if either the uh, Quentin Johnson or Josh Palmer are going to be the number, a true number one in that offense. But again, like if we're chasing this year's Nico, the guy who has the, the, the possibility of being the number one in a good offense, like, yeah, that, that would be the range of outcomes. So like moving those down, guys down the board, but taking my dart throws at wide receiver threes that could get there. Uh, moving on to Kansas City, we're not going to talk about Rasheed Rice, like legal problems. He would be a guy that I think I have uh, in my uh, wide receiver one range of outcomes. Uh, probably like a high second round pick is what I'd be looking at Rasheed Rice. So again, the beginning of the season, um, he was being integrated into the offense. The snap share goes up at the end of the season. Now he's starting to hit those double digit targets, expecting that the the downgrade overall and Travis Kelsey um, because of age. So we could maybe write the story where, where Rasheed Rice is in that 160 type target range, um, 170, maybe 180 tar- uh, targets a game or 10 targets a game type of range. That would be something that I could definitely see occurring. Um, also, we could write the story where the skill set gets a little bit better. Um, moving forward so like he's not limited to this yak type guy because we did see a little bit at the end of the last year the, where that was going on he's attached to Patrick Mahomes I don't think Hollywood Brown and Rasheed Rice have the same skill set Hollywood Brown's probably going to open it up to the outside there were targets in that offense that were going to other guys in that offense uh, even as uh, Rasheed Rice got better as the season went on so this would be a guy that like I like I said I only have three guys that I would definitely feel comfortable taking in the first round of the draft as wide receivers. Rasheed Rice would be a fringe guy at the end of the first, early second that I think has enough uh, upside with enough baked in uh, security to to at least give me a push at that 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 ranking. 
Uh, I Michael Pittman would be a guy I have listed as one of my wide receiver ones right now. Uh, be just be purely based off of volume, 156, and that's between two quarterbacks. Even with uh, Anthony Richardson in the game, he was still getting peppered. So, I mean, you're looking at a guy that's going to be able to probably get you that like close to 10 targets a game that you're looking at. May not be the bestest in the world. Um, there's a little bit of a you know, uh, you know, question mark behind Anthony Richardson. I would still kind of want to know who the backup quarterback is because I don't know if I would necessarily trust Anthony Richardson to finish the season. And his two competition for targets are Alec Pierce and Josh Downs. I'm more concerned with the uh, tight end situation for the Colts. Uh, maybe one of these guys, Will Mallory or uh, you know Alec Ogletree, turning this around, or Andrew Ogletree turning around and, and being more of a target uh, hog than than I am actually the two wide receivers. Josh Downs, maybe, but again, he's he's going to be limited based off the of size and how he's going to function in the offense. I don't necessarily think he's going to hit that ten targets a game to to move into taking over for Michael Pittman as that like ten target guy uh, based off the skill set of what Michael Pittman does. Uh, there's just not a guy that's going to be able to replace that. So again, Michael Pittman would be a guy that I would be comfortable giving a second round grade to um, as, as a wide receiver one going into the year. Let's see. Washington, uh, again, the quarterback situation is going to be a little hard to process. So Terry McLaurin is still the guy, 132. Got the size, got the speed. It's mostly going to be the quarterback situation, probably going to be undervalued. Um, but again, like he's just really disappointed, like every year he's been in the the league and that's based off of uh, quarterback play. But overall, like that's the guy that's got a chance to finish as the number one in the, in their offense. And that's the biggest thing that we're looking for when we're trying to find like P this year's Puka, Keenan Allen, M Michael Pittman or Nico. Um, just it's just value versus what we're spending. So uh, CD Lamb going to be was the wide receiver one going to be my wide receiver one. He would be the only guy that I would. Uh, feel really comfortable taking in the front end of the draft and even having a conversation with taking over like CMC or Brees. And that's primarily like there's not going to be a guy that he's competing for targets within the role that he plays in the offense. Uh, they got rid of uh, Michael Gallup and then uh, uh, Brandon Cooks is going to be the number two. The, the role that Brandon Cooks is going to play in the offense is going to be that like secondary guy. Hey, we're going to punish you for trying to take away CD. And then uh, uh, Jake Ferguson may end up being the number two in the offense. But again, their roles are going to be so different that that pecking order is going to be very well defined. Um, even losing uh, Tony Pollard right now, like those potential vacated targets would slot in very good to go to CD Lamb in the slot. Uh, so, you know, outside of the maybe some of the questions about the DAC situation that's brewing in, in Dallas, like he would be the guy that like, hey, he did it last year. I don't see a road that like he would end up disappointing. He may not be the wide receiver one at the end of the year, but it's really hard to tell a story where he doesn't put up like a very similar stat line, like 181 targets, 135, 1749 and 12 touchdowns. And I think I've talked about it before on this channel with uh, the Michael Thomas a few years back. The year before he put up his like 144 uh, receptions on a season, I talked to both my co-managers and I was like, the reason why I downplayed Michael Thomas going to the draft was I was like, well, you know, if if he continues to improve, he's going to have like a record set setting season. And he went and did that. So you got to look at like CD Lamb, that that the over under line. This is why I don't do projections on players like the over under on CD Lamb is that like 181, 135, 1749, 12 touchdowns. And and man, if if he goes over that line, you're like moving heavily into legendary season, like you know, 15 touchdowns, he's pushing 2,000 yards, 150 receptions. Like those are just numbers that like it doesn't matter if he can hit them. It's ones that I'm gonna bet the under on all the time. But I you know, he's the number one. I think he's a top five guy in fantasy this year, uh, going into the draft. All right, Dolphins. This is another really interesting one. So Tyreek Hill over the AJ Apex. So um, I would be betting on some type of age-related decline. It doesn't matter how good he is. It doesn't matter how good he still is. It's just a matter of like, you know, father time is undefeated. And then I'm going to pair him with uh, Jalen Waddle. And I would actually bet that Jalen Waddle takes over the number one in this offense next year. That would be my guess. So now I'm going to be ranking Jalen Waddle with potential wide receiver one overall upside and looking at him versus relative to where he's going in the draft, just based off of like basic stuff I've been looking at, like he's going to be probably a priority in all my leagues. Cause I can, I can guarantee I can go get him. Uh, Tyree kill. If he goes as a top five pick in most drafts, I can't guarantee I can get him Jalen Waddle. I can go up and I can get, let's see. 
uh, the Eagles. And again, for those of you guys that follow the channel, like AJ Brown, he's going to have those weeks. It doesn't matter how good he is where he's not the number one in the offense. They got Dallas Goddard, Devontae Smith. They're going to bring in Saquon. Jalen Hurts is the uh, de facto uh, goal line running back at this point. They're like it's, it just becomes an issue where like, I don't care how, how good he is. 158 targets, 106, uh, 1456 and seven touchdowns. I don't care about that. There are going to be weeks where it's just not his week. Like he has, where was the week we talked about earlier in the season um, where the six, uh, the six targets, four receptions, 29 yards in week two, he does that in the chip. And like he did in, in week 18, one for one for nine, he does that in the wrong week and and, and you don't win. You know, here's another one, uh, week uh, 11 against Kansas City, four for one for eight. Like those weeks are going to happen because teams are going to go, you're not going to beat us with A.J. Brown. You're going to beat us with somebody else. And the Eagles are like, okay, your terms are acceptable. So like I would just know that with an A.J. Brown. So it doesn't matter if he finishes his wide receiver seven because that's going to put him in the second round of my draft. Um, I'm going to downgrade him to a third round pick every single year because I know those void weeks are going to happen, those sub 40 degree days that are going to lose me a week. All right. And then Devontae Smith, obviously, he does have the possibility to finish as a wide receiver one. Um, overall, it just, again, this is how much you can predict it. I, I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know how you can tell the story where he finishes as a wide receiver one because you're either banking on AJ Brown, uh, you know, injury or something along that line, or just massive flop in how the off often functions. He's gonna be like Jalen Waddle. I thought Jalen Waddle and uh, uh, Devontae Smith last year were overvalued. This year, I think they're gonna be both undervalued. So again, something that I would be interested in. And again, I'm not a huge guy on contract situations, but the the reality of it is. Um, on top of like what some of the uh, the GM speak goes on is Devontae Smith is a number one wide receiver in a number two role. So maybe there's something there from an upside standpoint. From a fantasy perspective, we don't care anything about that. We care about value overall uh, or co rel uh, return on investment relative to cost. All right, uh, Falcons. So I do have Drake London right now uh, ranked as a uh, – no, I actually moved him down today when I was getting ready to do this. So Drake London is ranked as, I think, my wide receiver 11 as of today. Um, the biggest thing with this is, again, I talked about this before, like maybe Kirk Cousins is an, uh, an upgrade, maybe he's a downgrade, maybe he's a push. We don't know any of that. Even with all the bad quarterback play last year, 110 targets, uh, 69 for a 906 or a 905, two touchdowns. And that's with some like really inconsistent overall usage and play. The biggest thing is projecting that upside. So if if I if I push him all the way up to like say the you know, wide receiver five at the at the end of the first round of the draft, if I push him up even to an early second round draft pick, like you're getting to the point where his uh, likely you know, range of outcomes or, or his likely outcome for the season uh, is going to be capped at what you're you're drafting him as. And again. That's the the top end of what he can be. Um, I do think he has wide receiver one overall into his upside. So it's going to be really hard to overvalue him. It's going to be much easier to, uh, or it's going to be much harder to put him in the wrong spot where he just can't return. So again, like right now, I could definitely see he may be worth in a, a late first in a lot of leagues. That would probably be too pricey for me. But overall, like, yeah, it's there. The the All the tea leaves are there. New quarterback. Um, the other thing that I would probably downgrade him a little bit on is uh, if Kyle Pitts ends up being the number one on the offense, it doesn't matter if he's the number one wide receiver, he's going to move down to being like the number two overall on the offense, which would probably make him an overall wide receiver two based off where he is. And then it's the road for Kyle Pitts to be like uh, elite as a tight end um, would cut into, it would be much easier for Kyle Pitts to do. And then it would cut into the upside of Jake Drake London. So I would probably, that's why I'd moved him down today. I was like, ah, oh, man, I'm getting really close to, to ranking him as wide receiver one. I think there's just, there's too much risk that he, he's going to cap out because of the Kirk Cousins situation and Kyle Pitts actually living up to his, his, uh, his upside. All right. And uh, with Kyle or with Drake London, I'm not really worried about, uh, what's his face, uh, being brought in. If I can even remember his name from, uh, the Rams or excuse me, from, from the bears. Uh, I'm just not really, really worried about like the other guys that he'd be convert. Kind of, uh, he would be uh, competing with targets with with the uh, the Falcons. All right, the Giants. So right now there's nobody on the Giants. So again, uh, the guy that uh, I would be looking at to 
potentially take over this would be Jalen Hyatt. Maybe, maybe again, we have questions about the quarterback situation. Um, they did go out and uh, make a move in the off season. I'm, I am again, this is just going to be a based off of cost with Jalen Hyatt. Like that would be the guy that I would put at the end of my draft board, say maybe he's got the opportunity to finish as a wide receiver one in the offense. I don't think he's got the ability to finish as the number one or a number wide receiver one overall. And that's why like, he's going to be ranked probably in that wide receiver three type range. There is a lot of upside to him. There also is a lot of downside to him. So again, he's just going to be in that range of going like, you know, I, I can take a guy who might finish as the number one in the offense. And that has fantasy value, even if it doesn't have like league winning value uh, moving on to Jacksonville. So, uh, and this is like, you know, obviously from last year, um, they brought in Gabe Davis. You have uh, Zay Jones is coming back. Uh, Christian Kirk, I think they're all kind of capped uh, at where they're going to be. Maybe Gabe Davis has the best uh, opportunity to be that like big X and and take on like a huge val a volume role. Like Christian Kirk's going to be that uh, uh, you know vertical slot, and then Zay Jones is kind of like a complementary guy. I think he's going to be capped out even as a wide receiver too. Uh, Christian Kirk's going to be like again really hard to tell the story where he gets up to that like 180 targets that we're probably going to need him to get to, to be a wide receiver one, even if he's the, uh, or to be the top end elite type wide receiver one that we're looking for. So even if he can finish his maybe a fringe wide receiver one, because he could be the number one in the offense, it's going to be really hard to walk that road. And again, with uh, Gabe Davis going to a new team, um, that that's one of the variables we look for. He is attached to like, what's not going to be a bad quarterback. So the return on investment on like a Gabe Davis or Christian Kirk, there is enough there between the two of those guys to go like there, there is a dart throw to throw at, but they're, they're going to probably be in that like low end two to high end three type of range going into the draft. So with the jets, uh, Garrett Wilson is a guy right now. I have Garrett Wilson rated as my wide receiver two overall going into the draft. So that means like he's going to be mid first round draft pick. And this would be way too pricey for me, even though I would have him um, uh, ranked here. The idea is like, he, there's very little upside to return on that investment. And all there is, is risk when you take on, take uh, a guy like this. But again, um, his, his, the closest competition for targets that he's going to have is Mike Williams. If he comes back. So we're banking on an improved offensive line and Aaron Rodgers, And again, like, with last year with all the bad quarterback play 168 targets so the range of outcomes with better quarterback play even if we're not going to even I don't I wouldn't even bring up the fact that you know Aaron Rodgers when he was back with the Jets or with the Packers like you know picking Devontae Adams and just throwing him all those passes that's that's a possibility but it's it's not something that I can statistically look at to such an extent that I can bank on it but overall like 168 targets last year we're, we're looking at uh, improved efficiency on those targets the 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 touchdowns could go up I mean he should be ranked as wide receiver two overall because even if Mike Williams is healthy he's not going to be that type of number two at best at best with Garrett Wilson and Mike Williams. Uh, Cause they're, they're right now. Like I'm not really worried about Tyler Conklin. I'm maybe a little bit more worried about Brees Hall. Mike Williams may have those weeks where he can uh, you know, be a T Higgins and, and, and make Garrett Wilson have those down weeks. But when I talk about that, Garrett, the way that Garrett Wilson can be used within the offense uh, is a little bit more open than maybe Jamar Chase would be used in the offense. I mean, the, the, you're splitting hairs to a certain extent, um, but I, I definitely think that like just the way that the offenses are designed, um, that's why I would probably put Garrett Wilson up higher um, based off of, uh, you know, the two of them. And this is not a, a knock, a, a, a physical knock on Jamar Chase. It's it's can we project the targets to hit the the 10 to, to 12 range that, that we're kind of looking for uh, maybe with Garrett Wilson. Cause I don't see, I don't see, uh, uh, and you could argue this with T will T T Higgins, T Higgins being used in the screen game, T Higgins being used on like underneath routes or those possession type routes. Maybe that's not a key Hick Higgins thing. It's probably, probably not also a Mike Williams thing coming off an of injury. So maybe you could make the argument if, if you're going to, uh, you know, I shouldn't be upgrading Garrett Wilson. Um, and, and, and downgrading Jamar Chase at the same time. Maybe you can make that argument. But like right now, just based off of what we saw last year, like I'm not downgrading Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson based off of injuries last year. Um, all I'm saying is like 
the targets were already there with Garrett Wilson. The only real caveat that we can look at is maybe Mike Williams eats into him a little bit more than, than we would like uh, going forward. All right. Uh, Lions. So the, the, this is a little interesting. Um, I have uh, the sun God still ranked. I think as wide receiver nine right now. And I, I'll, I'm going to readjust everything and put that video out. Like I did with the running backs by the end of the week. So anyway, with uh, Amon Ra, uh, I could definitely see that like he's going to do the same thing that he did with a, with a little bit of injuries missed. He wish, m- missed week five. Um, he did have 164 targets. I could see that staying relatively stable. But again, like you're looking at a full year of Jamison Williams, a full year of Jamar, Ch- or uh, excuse me, of uh, Gibbs, a full year of um, uh, Sam Laporta. Like maybe there's a, a little bit more variance to where Amon Ra goes this year. I like I said, I have him in uh, wide receiver nine. He finishes at wide receiver twelve. You're you're still relatively getting return on investment. It just becomes really hard to walk uh, the sun god up back to wide receiver three this year without that competition. Even though I think he's relatively safe, um, drafting him towards the the top end his ceiling of what he's going to do, and then. Maybe there's a maybe that you could make an argument with Jamison Williams making that jump all the way uh, towards wide receiver, wide receiver one land uh, just by having a full season and and being integrated in the offense. He probably has a slightly higher upside uh, based off his skill set than uh, the Sun God is, but I mean, there's a lot of mouths to feed and telling that story where he can get to you know 160 targets, even if they're like really efficient, 150 targets really efficient. It's going to be difficult to do. But I, I think there's a better chance he eats into the sun god than the sun god eats into him. All right, Packers. And this is going to be, like, really interesting next year. Uh, there's Bo Melton who finished the season, like, interesting enough. At the end of the season, you still are going to have Jaden Reed coming back who had was flirting with some fantasy relevance. Uh, Don Tavian Wicks is going to be coming back like that big body X. Um, and that's before we get to the actual number one and number two in the offense which is Romeo Dobbs, who was all over the place just when we thought he was going to be like, you know, flirting with a, you know, very solid wide receiver ones or wide receiver status last year based off of like injuries. He just didn't do it. And then there were weeks where we're like, well, I guess he's not going to be a thing. And then he was able to do it. Like, you know, you see week four, 13 targets. And uh, where's it at? Week, week 16, he goes, you know, uh, four for five, 79 touchdown. So there's an, uh, there's a chance that he is the number one in the offense next year. I think there's a lot of mouths to feed. And the same thing with like Christian Watson, he really battled injuries. And again, like you're probably looking at him being like a Brandon Ayuk where he has to be like very efficient on lower targets. So he's probably going to be like in a good week, like six for eight, you know, or in a bad week, he's going to be like two for four on usage overall. So again, there is a possibility of wide receiver one upside. There is more than likely he's going to be like that, that the boom bust three type of range. He probably should be ranked closer to that low end two because of that range of outcomes. All right. So uh, the Panthers, and this was one was a really interesting one. I should actually probably go pull up the Steelers to talk about Deontay Johnson going to uh, the, the Panthers. So right now, Deontay Johnson, I think I have him rated as wide receiver 13 or 14 overall. Um, we, this would be one of the guys that I would expect that he has been a target hog in the past. He is going to a new offense. We can split hairs about whether or not Bryce Young is good at football or not. It does look like the Panthers want to not throw the draft pick away. And then based off of value, I mean, it, it, it's not going to be difficult to get to push Deontay Johnson back into that like 144, you know, he did 169 targets in 2001. So getting him back into that range of high end two from a target target standpoint to, to even like low end one there, it's not, that's not a difficult story to get to again, probably a flawed overall player, uh, which is going to cap his upside, but to actually go like, Oh, where should he be valued? Well, yeah, like you're looking at like mid range wide receiver two going to a new offense that has upside to crack the top 10. Like, you know, I had him ranked earlier in the season as a free, as, as a low end wide receiver one. I had to downgrade him just slightly because there are some variables to it, but overall, like his range of outcomes is going to be like ridiculous based off of what we've seen guys getting moved in new offenses to take over that number one role. 
All right, Texans. So this is a little interesting. So last year, uh, Nico Collins was not difficult because he he did have the possibility to finish as the number one in this offense. Only 109 targets, did miss some time because of injury. And then you are we are looking at having Tank Dell back and then Noah Brown, uh, I think, is still going to be a part of this offense. So again, like trying to figure out where the targets are going to go on a week-to-week basis, this is why I would probably downgrade Nico Collins. You are probably going to be looking at um, him finishing as the number one in the offense, even though it's going to have he's going to be very inconsistent on a week to week basis. If it, is it going to be a tank Dell week? Uh, they're probably going to be no brown weeks, and uh, you also are going to have probably uh, Dalton Schultz we- Dalton Schult weeks, and that's on top of the fact that the offense needs to stay higher vo- passing volume. And if Joe Mixon comes in and Joe Mixon is at least serviceable. The offense is going to be like you know balanced, and balance is not good from trying to pick some of these guys up. So again, like I think, I think like high end to mid range uh, wide receiver two, which would put him probably like third or fourth round in the mix as a value. And I just don't think that he's going to have that wide receiver one upside overall. That that top ten type of guy, uh, Tennessee. Uh, obviously, uh, DeAndre or DeAndre Hopkins going to be over the age apex. He's going to be similar probably in usage to how Keenan Allen's going to uh, shake out for the Bears. So he's going to have like some wide receiver three, a t- wide receiver two appeal. He's not going to be able to get back up into that wide receiver one land that he did uh, for a little while. And then uh, going back to the Jaguars, uh, post hype sleeper type guy with uh, Calvin Ridley going to Tennessee again moving a guy to a new situation where he can be the number one in the offense. Uh, Again, this may have a little bit more to do with uh, how good Will Levis is at football, but again, 136 targets last year, probably going to be coming in. I I definitely can maybe push him into 150 targets going into a new offense. I do really like, uh, it's going to be coming down to what his ADP is versus where I rank him. There's going to be a massive range of outcomes for Calvin Ridley. You're looking at possibility of top five wide receiver. You're also looking for a guy that's like, or looking looking at a guy that could be sub wide receiver three when it comes to that. And he is at the edge or at the end of the age apex going into the season. And then finally to finish all of this, all right, I guess I skipped a whole bunch of guys. Uh, the Jets I already talked about Garrett Wilson. Lions, I already talked about, like, who did I skip on? Uh, Panthers, Patriots. Uh, Patriots, no idea what the wide receiver situation is going to be. The, all the guys that they have there right now, um, none of them I would I would say are going to be uh, a traditional wide receiver one. I would probably, if I had to bank on anybody, it would probably be Hunter Henry. Don't know the quarterback situation. I'm going to imagine they're going to figure out someone to bring in because these wide receivers are just not, not going to be guys that you can bank on overall. And, and at the end of the day, like um, I probably wouldn't be drafting any of these guys. If they make a move, that would be the guy that I would be looking at. Um, looking at the Raiders going forward. Uh, Deontay Adams, he's going to be over the age apex. I still have him as a fringe wide receiver one. Maybe it's Aiden O'Connell, probably going to be Gardner Minshew. Uh, again, this is going to be heavily based off of targets, 175. I could see that taking a, a step back this year. I could also see that overall that his uh, the eight, you know, uh, father time is going to be undefeated. Move, him moving more into that Keenan uh, Allen type of like possession guy instead of some of that downfield stuff that we kind of like. So 150 targets, probably, you know, uh, maybe like 80, 90 balls. You're know, probably going to be very similar in the, the the overall yards. I get out, actually see the tight, uh, the touchdown spiking a little bit. Uh, but the new quarterback with Gardner Minshew does, I do like that. I just wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable taking him in the first round of the draft overall. So I would probably downgrade him but I do have him right now as my wide receiver five. And then uh, uh, Jacoby Myers, I don't really even think has a range of outcomes to be outside of maybe if the offense changes a little bit, they become a little bit more uh, uh, passing heavy, which I don't see under uh, head coach Antonio Pierce. Um, Maybe he can be a a solid wide receiver too. But again, like that would be the big competition for targets. Uh, Going back just because I'm kind of, you know, me, uh, Trey Tucker, maybe the guy that I would expect the, the rookie that was coming on at certain points of the season, I maybe expect Trey Tucker's going to eat into Devonte Adams a little bit more so than I could expect, uh, 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 Jacoby Myers eating into, uh, uh, Devonte, uh, the Rams. So this is why I have Puka Nakua rated as wide receiver three this year. Uh, so Cooper cup over the AJ Pex, he already had a decline at the end of the season overall. So maybe he's not 
maybe father time's gotten to him. Those injuries have gotten to him. Um, he's over the age apex. That means there, there may not be the competition for targets for Puka. And you're already looking at a guy who did 160 targets last year. So there is a little bit of a potential story where we can have an upside in receptions and yards and uh, touchdowns occurring this year because of the potential for a little bit more uh, downgrade to Cooper Cup. Uh, Puka could be used as the, the number one, and then Cooper Cup could be used as the number two within the offense. That could be there. I feel relatively confident that if I was drafting Puka at three, you know, what's the worst I'm going to get? Like wide receiver seven, Um, even if Cooper Cup takes us, magically is able to regain a certain amount of form. Um, maybe they're both wide receiver ones next year. They're both top 10 guys. I could definitely see the, the, the safety of taking Puka high is probably going to still be there. Um, I'm not as concerned with uh, Cooper cup overall, it's still going to be a relatively high passing volume offense, like all things there. Um, and I'm not too concerned with the tight ends eating into that. Uh, I think the role is going to be relatively safe. If again, if uh, you're looking at a guy that at, at a, you know, at worst is going to be like the sun God, except there isn't going to be as much competition for opportunity in the offense. Overall, he's probably the, the number one in the passing game, maybe the number one overall in the offense, depending on, you know, Kyron Williams. All right. And then Baltimore. So a little bit of interesting stuff going on with this, like Zay flowers, like we're, we're kind of be, trying to guess how many more targets he's going to get in this offense. Mark Andrews back. I don't know how much I would necessarily buy that Mark Andrews still has the opportunity to be the number one in the offense. Again, age and injury. So maybe I'm buying into a little bit of Zay Flowers. Maybe there's there's a story I can tell where, where Zay Flowers becomes that downfield threat with the possession, the gadget stuff that he was using. Maybe I can get there. Maybe I can get up to 150, 160 targets with him. That would put him potentially on the outside of uh, the first round of the draft with upside. So I could definitely see all this going on with him. He would be a guy that I would be really interested in targeting versus ADP. Um, so we'll be looking at that. I do think I have him uh, probably as a top 20 guy. And uh, overall, I'd have to look at all my stuff. I think he's just outside of the top 20 right now. But uh, overall, I think that's pretty fair. And then uh, the Saints, Chris Olave. His skill set is always going to be limited. It's not really an issue of the quarterback play. It's just that he's he doesn't have the stuff that is necessary to take over uh, and and be that 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 less than flawed uh, talent. And so, from a fantasy perspective, he's just not going to be able to give the stuff that we need to 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 get there. So he's always probably going to be a fringe. Uh, wide receiver one, you know, on the other side as a wide receiver and wide receiver two land because of the, those limitations that are going to go on with him. And again, like, you know, probably maybe has a little bit of upside to crack the top 10. He will probably do that at a certain point in the career. It's going to be like non-predictive when he's going to do that on a year to year basis. You know, again, like he gets a few more touchdowns, you know, he gets a few more targets to go in his direction. He pops in like you see he had 138 targets last year. I could definitely see he gets 150 160 targets, a few more touchdowns, and then you know, you're at 1,300 yards. He cracks the top 10 for wide receiver. Can he do it the next year? So, again, you're looking at a guy that's probably going to be best valued as an early third, um, may end up uh, creeping into that late second overall. But that would be where I would – I would wherever I put uh, Chris Olave, it's going to be based on the fact that like he doesn't have a lot of upside and he also doesn't have a lot of risk. Uh, probably similar thinking of like, uh, you know, uh, you know, Brandon Cooks would be a poor man's Chris Olave from a few years back. I guess the way that you could kind of look at that. And I don't really, I'm not really concerned with some of the other guys really eating into uh, who he is going to be in the offense. Uh, so I, was, I don't, I don't even know if any of those are necessarily going to be uh, uh, competition for opportunity. And then with Seattle, like uh, Tyler Lockett's going to be over the age apex. I think uh, JSN is going to be flawed overall. I think he's going to have probably appeal as a wide receiver two upside uh but overall like i, I don't know if dk has the skill set the way that they want to use him to really hit the uh the, the the target volume that he needs to to get to get over the 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 line of what needs to go on so like maybe he can get back up to 150 targets on the season um maybe not the other thing that i would be a little bit worried about when it comes to seattle is the, the second uh contract noah fant 
like he could end up being worked into the offense as that like number two, number three in the offense. And then Tyler Lockett, you know, obviously, uh, you know, taking a, uh, 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 a step back in age is something that we could probably guess on JSN being limited within his role. And then uh, DK is probably going to end up being that mid range wide receiver two that he's always been. I just don't see there's a, you know, banking on a, a, a year where we actually see that, uh, you know, uh, you know, him take the step forward and it's never going to happen. And there's reasons why it's never going to happen, especially if he's attached to a quarterback that's probably going to be limited in Geno Smith. And then it's the Steelers. So I'll get another one will be George Pickens um, expecting that there's maybe the opportunity uh, to push him forward in, into the next tier. This is going to be very difficult to properly value him because there's going to be a lot of expectations that he takes a step forward, especially after uh, week 17 um, and or, or week 16, week 17 last year. You're looking at the other, also the question of who the quarterback is going to be, how the offense is going to play out. A again, muting the expectations. Yes. Could he finish as a top 10 wide receiver? Yes. Could he also disappoint? Yes. So now like fifth round pick, maybe, maybe is where he should be going. Um, maybe a fourth round pick, you know, once he starts getting pushed in that third round role, it becomes harder and harder to really uh, talk about him. And I could also see that like he could get hype trained up into the second. Uh, already talked about Houston. Uh, already talked about Tennessee. And then to finish with uh, the Vikings. So there's, there's one thing to talk about before we even get into Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison. And that's going to be that, uh, Sam Darnold's the quarterback. Uh, I like Sam Darnold as a as, as a prospect, as a player. I think he's flawed. Um, I, I don't necessarily think he's a, a significant downgrade to uh, Kirk Cousins. But the asterisk behind that is that like it, it's a variable and it could go either way, one way or another. And if I had to guess on overall how it's going to affect the offense, I would probably end up saying it, it should be viewed as a downgrade. So like I said, like with Justin Jefferson, um, that quarterback situation hurts him. And then we can start talking about Jordan Addison and then eventually TJ Hawkinson. So if I already am not very comfortable drafting Jamar Chase within the first round of my draft, I end up being very uncomfortable drafting Justin Jefferson. I don't care if he's you know the best wide receiver in football. I don't care about his skill set. This is purely based off of opportunity. And again, again, like we want uh great players on okay offenses with limited opportunity. Well, uh, the offense may not be good, especially with uh, what's his face, uh, Sam Darnold coming in. He's going to have a lot of competition, uh, a lot of uh, competition for uh, opportunity early in the season with Jordan Addison, who did have a, a fairly good year. Like, this is what I predicted he was going to be. He's going to be a wide receiver too. And even with all that stuff that went on within uh, uh, Minnesota with the quarterback situations and the offense, again. Uh, you know, he was able to uh, you know, primarily return on investment overall. And then uh, you're talking about he's going to be potentially able to take that step forward in targets, so 110, uh, 120, 130 targets. They drafted him to take uh, the pressure off of the offense when teams decided to take away uh, Justin Jefferson. We didn't get a great opportunity to see that last year because of all the situation that was going on in Minnesota. So this could be the year that we see that. So you could see. Uh, what I would be guessing is you're going to see between the two of these guys when it comes to targets overall that they're going to be a lot closer to each other, even though at the end of the season, once everything kind of equalizes each other out, you're still looking at uh, Justin Jefferson hitting like um, 10, 10, uh, the last, uh, last four weeks, uh, 10, three times, and then 14 to, to finish the season off. So like I'm not, you know, and then the start of the season off 12, 13, 13. I'm not too concerned with Justin Jefferson overall. But again, and the other thing that I would slightly downgrade Justin Jefferson on is the fact that like TJ Hawkinson is going to come back. He in one way, shape or form is going to influence the offense at the end of the season going into the playoffs. So I think top end value for Justin Jefferson is going to be a little bit capped going into the next season. And again, if you have Justin Jefferson ranked as like, you know, a top five guy or, you know, overall or a top five wide receiver, I don't blame you for it, but again, this is where I would value them based off the uh, the, uh, the variables. So if I get Justin Jefferson in the second, and I think we all agree that 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 we would we would take that pick all day long. It just becomes an issue of uh, how much value is left in him if you're taking him at five versus the risk. And and right now with Justin Jefferson, I, I think that there's probably too much 
risk involved with taking him next year relative to him potentially having a legendary season. So anyways, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of these wide receivers and some of these wide receiver groupings, hopefully at the end of this, uh, for the over the course of this week. And then I'll put out the overall rankings. I don't know. I think I have like 50 guys or so um, in this group. And then uh, maybe I'll talk about some of the wide receivers that are going to come in because we're looking at overall the, uh, the teams that have vacated opportunities where a guy could step in and be the number one. Because again, I'm less concerned with getting a wide receiver two unless I spent wide receiver three capital on them. So like when I look at the offenses overall and like Buffalo Bills, if Stefan Diggs takes a step back, there are a couple of wide receivers that are already there in Buffalo. Maybe I'm a little bit more concerned that Dalton Kincaid can be that number one there than expecting that the draft will change things. The Cardinals and the Chargers, I definitely think that the draft could change things overall for for who their number one is uh, from a value perspective. The Broncos have a void that could have potentially have a top-end guy that could slip into there. Um, trying to look at some of the teams that we have. The, the Giants could potentially bring in a guy to be a, a, a number one. Um, I don't think that I don't think the Jacksonville Jaguars are, are moving in that direction overall. Uh, the Patriots got to bring somebody in. That's bad. Um, let's see, looking at some of these other teams that we have out there. And I think that's it. So there's a handful of teams that I could definitely see that the, the, the rookie wide receiver that they could bring in is going to be vaulted up the board. Um, and we we could find that Puka or, or something along those lines uh, as the season goes on or the, the off season goes on. So anyway, uh, keep this under an hour. I probably the next couple ones this week will be uh, a little bit shorter. And then uh, obviously the rankings video at the end of the week, if I get to it, will be uh, rather long.